there's been a bit of business news in the motorsports world. I think we want to start with IndyCar announcing a charter system, which was pretty fascinating because if you look at the history of IndyCar, you know, they have gone through the the days, the PBG IndyCar World Series, which then became the split of IRL and CART. CART became almost like a franchise public company thing. The teams owned a portion of it. Then it went back to being reunited. They've been sort of that open, you know, just if you can provide a car and that sort of thing and show up and there's enough grid spots, you can be a part of it. Uh, but now they're entering this charter system that is, – is it similar to NASCAR? Is that where they got the idea? And sort of what, is this, what does this entail for IndyCar going forward? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's a great point about CART because, of course, you know, when you look back at the history of IndyCar, you actually at one point did have a, a league that was kind of like a true franchise system like you see in Stick and Ball because that is what Stick and Ball Sports is, is that the team owners of each individual franchise own the league collectively. And, of course, that's way different from what we traditionally see in motorsports at this point, uh, you know, certainly with, with NASCAR, for example, but I think really all the major series. And so it's certainly at least at this point. And, yes, to, to your broader question, I think, look, Roger Penske, who owns IndyCar, is a team owner in NASCAR. And we know NASCAR is now coming up on, you know, nine years of having completed their charter system. Uh, you know, 13 of 15 teams have renewed for seven more years. And so we know about all that. And I think Roger Penske looked at the system in NASCAR that he's a part of as a team owner and said, look, this system has provided enough stability and enough enterprise value, which I think is kind of the key term, to team owners in NASCAR that it seems like it's something that we should try in IndyCar as well. And, for example, we just saw yesterday Ed Carpenter Racing announced a new uh, investor, which from what we understand they really needed. And the investor and Ed Carpenter himself have both said publicly at this point that the charter system was something that helped get him to come in. So it's something that helps professionalize the sport, as we know. Uh, you look at, for example, Justin Marks. They were able to just bring in a major investor recently in, in Mark Lazarus. Um, and he's someone who's invested. He was a former owner of the Milwaukee Bucks. And he's someone who's you know invested in a lot of different sports. He's someone who understands franchises. And so I think it's a similar thing in IndyCars. They wanted to try and have a system that could eventually create enterprise value. We know when NASCAR first started their system, charters were basically selling for a couple million bucks. And some people thought you were crazy for even spending a couple million bucks. And they reached an all-time high of, from what I understand, a couple million dollars less than, 30, uh, less than $40 million last year. Somewhere around $37, $38 million last year when, when Spire purchased that record one. And so... That's clearly created a lot of um, value for team owners. We know when Chip Ganassi got out of NASCAR and sold to Justin Marks, he was able to make a nice eight-figure sum. That sum never got revealed, but it's probably at least 20 to $25 million that Justin Marks paid Chip Ganassi. That if Chip was getting out previously, he wouldn't have made anywhere near that. He would have just sold his parts and pieces for a couple million at best. At best. Hmm. And so I think Roger Penske saw that and said, let's try that in IndyCar. Interesting. Interesting. Is is that is this you know Parker and I we cover IndyCar and we talk about IndyCar but granted we are mostly NASCAR guys. Is this something that we knew was coming? Has this been in the works or did this kind of happen fast? It, it's been I'd say I think honestly to give full credit I think the first person reporting this was Marshall Pruitt from Racer Magazine and it was probably about six to eight months ago. Um, so it's been it's been in the works for I'd say basically all of of 2024. You know, maybe I would assume Penske and his top lieutenants were kind of planning it maybe in 2023. And it kind of leaked out to the public in 2024. And they've been working on it all year. And there's been a lot of back and forth about it, including from the fans. One of the interesting elements of this charter is, you know, for example, Zach Brown, the McLaren Racing CEO. One thing he said that doesn't really move the needle for him on it is it doesn't guarantee, guarantee him a starting spot in the Indy 500. Well, mm -hmm. why did they not do a guaranteed starting spot in the Indy 500? Because when this first leaked out, there was major, major pushback from the fans about, hey, no, we do not want to have any sort of system that takes away qualifying for the Indy 500. And there was such pushback from the fans that eventually IndyCar took that part out. So this is something that has been going through multiple iteration, iteration throughout the year. Um, and uh, uh, once again, to give credit to, to Racer and, and Marshall Pruitt, who's been all over this, he reported just this week that I believe there was, he said, two teams that just in recent weeks kind of did not want to sign on and eventually mm -hmm. signed on after some prodding from Penske Entertainment to, to get on board before they formally announced this. So, yes, this has definitely been uh, something they've been negotiating for several months. And 
it even seemed like there were some teams who didn't necessarily love every element of it uh, right through the end. You know, there's some interesting elements, for example. So they have 25 charters, but only 20, the only the top 22 of those charters are going to qualify for their leader circle revenue distribution program, which is worth about a million dollars a year per car that qualifies. So there's some interesting elements of it. That might have been part of the pushback from some of the owners. But, um, yeah, they've been working on it for, I'd say, for the better part of a year. And I, so you, I was you were kind of leading well, into Landon, my next – Landon, one second. I was going to get into that. I was going to get into that in the leader circle money. So, so just to be clear – only the top 22 get that basically million bucks. Is there any money that's guaranteed you just for having a charter similar to NASCAR? You know, for those cars that don't make the leader circle, is it a million dollar bonus to be in leader circle or there's just literally nothing if you're not there? Well, the leader circle is what IndyCar has had for several years now, but they're just kind of, you know, now reintegrating into this new system. But what's interesting is that they have created 25 charters to 10 different teams uh, you know, and from what we understand, those teams got it for free, similar to NASCAR it was based off the recent two years. But at this point, it doesn't seem like the, the you know, 23rd, 24th and 25th from what I, I don't know all the details at this point. So we're still kind of unpacking this. So we'll wait and see kind of what further comes out. But it seems like that 23rd, 24th and 25th team, you know, I don't see what major value they're going to have outside of just still owning that charter. And then if they want to leave the sport, they can sell it. But they're going to miss mm. out on it, what it appears to be the major revenue distribution, which again, I think might've been one of the things that some teams were pushing back on. I have yet to interview the IndyCar's top executives about this. And I, I'm looking forward to doing that and asking them what was their thought process. Did they just not have the money, you know, to go from 22 million ish to 25 million ish as kind of the total purse payout. Is it just that simple or is it something more complicated, something we need to figure out? Uh, but I think, yeah, there are, the leader circle is something IndyCar has been doing for years, but they've now kind of reintegrated into this new system. But there's still some questions about how it's all going to work. And, um, look, I mean, every team who's in that top 22 is going to get that payout. I don't know if there's going to be different levels to it, but there's going to be at least some form of a payout to all 22 of those teams. Well, it, right. it rhymes an awful lot to me with NASCAR's um, supposed, even though they've never enforced it, bottom three policy, right, where the bottom three performing teams sort of get a penalty uh, or could lose their charters. Obviously, that's not what directly correlated with this with this prize money from IndyCar, uh, but it is sort of similar. Where if you're one of the bottom performing teams, you're uh, potentially you know going to earn get a penalty. So uh, my my question for you, and it leads in with all of this, is okay. Knowing what we know now about the NASCAR charter system, everything that NASCAR teams have gone through, we know that very intimately over the last decade, right? All the negotiations, now we're kind of, we're almost through or completely through this second round of negotiations with the charter renewal system. Uh, we've seen the leverage points. What do we know about what IndyCar teams are about to go through or maybe just went through? Um, what do we know about that and what they're conversations have been or could look like and what is the future is in store for them yeah i mean i again like to going back to to zach brown he said this didn't really move the needle for him a lot so he's someone who feels like this isn't necessarily a game changer for indycar now look there are some owners who disagree uh chip ganassi said he feels like this was one of the most important days in indycar history when they announced this but i think when you look at it you know, a charter system, of course, it creates that enterprise value in the sense of now you need to get one of these if you want to be able to be in part of the leader circle. But at the end of the day, it's still the sport itself. And so, for example, these payouts are not going to be enough to you know, allow you to run an entire team just on those payouts, similar to NASCAR's system where, you know, the cost to run a top cup car is not really it's not really compensated fully by what you get from the charter system. So. I think you've seen some team owners who say, hey, this isn't really moving the needle a whole lot. It's kind of just kind of reshuffling what we already have in a, in a, into a new system that just kind of sounds good. Um, but I think IndyCar would push back and say, you know, we need to improve the sport overall, of course, but this is something that's going to give you guys now value if you want to get out of the sport. We'll see what these are eventually worth. Some people feel like, hey, you know, if we're getting a million bucks, you know, we could sell them for three times – forward revenue and sell for three million other people feel like it probably would it wouldn't sell for that much right now again we know nascar's charter system started off where they were just a couple million dollars and nascar has a much bigger tv deal than indycar so i think there's yeah. some team owners who feel like this didn't necessarily move the sport forward in a huge way 
Um, and then again, there was the back and forth about Indy. I I'm sure some team owners, as much as they feel like it would have annoyed some fans and would have taken some drama out of the system, you could say, like, when you look at NASCAR, for exa example, they were able to create a charter system and give guaranteed starting spots in the sport's biggest race, the Daytona 500, without a fan revolt. IndyCar was not able to achieve that, unfortunately. They had a borderline yeah. fan revolt about giving guaranteed spots into their biggest race, and as a result, their new system doesn't give guaranteed spots to their biggest race. That would have arguably been one of the biggest values of an IndyCar charter, is if you had a guaranteed spot in this Indy 500. You don't have that so, because of the whole... So I think that's that's been some of the pushback. It, and that, Look, as a fan, and we talked about it when that was being discussed... You know, I think the Indy 500 qualifying is one of the great, the best shows in all of global motorsports because it's just incredible pressure. It's a, it's the greatest mix of speed and daring and handling and everything all together, mixed into this wonderful two-day package of seeing who gets in and who gets the pole. Um, so I'm happy, you know, just as a fan, to not see that. And I think if you think about what NASCAR did, you know, they had that top 36 rule beforehand that sort of eased fans of this idea of like, hey. Drivers will be sort of locked into this, right? Um, which then allowed them to go that path. And I know that's not building the enterprise value that maybe those IndyCar owners wanted, but I think it is personally just as a fan. So cool. Some other things I saw, I just want to know if I'm correct on this. So there's almost a, I believe I saw the, the limit on amount of drivers that you can have drive in a season is three now, basically in one car. So sort of hmm. trying to stop some of the, uh, the smaller teams we've seen that go through tons of different drivers that can bring funding race by race, that sort of thing, which I think is a, is a good rule. Um, and then the, the other interesting one I thought that I saw is that you can only have three cars now, basically. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And so we saw, for example, Chip Ganassi racing, they're a team that had to, you know, downsize by two cars basically for, for this upcoming year. So, you know, of course, it's interesting that IndyCar is doing this at the same time NASCAR appears to be doing this with their new charter system. Of course, NASCAR has not formally announced the whole terms of their new, new charter system yet because they had 13 of 15 teams approve it, and they're still trying to work over those final two. But from, we, from what we've heard, from what we've seen reported, it appears like NASCAR is doing the same thing, of course, which is, is fascinating in NASCAR, where they're going from, of course, you know, the long time of you should be able to have many cars, of course, and then the charter system, you have only could have a maximum of four to now uh, a maximum of three. So, again, I haven't been able to inter interview uh, Mark Miles yet, the IndyCar CEO. I'm hoping to do that in the coming days. But I would presume this is part of them trying to just have more parity uh, throughout the field. I think that's similar to what, what NASCAR's thought process is, is to just not have a couple teams that just dominate everything and, you know, spread the love out throughout the field. So, um, you know, I think that's what the thought process likely is there. And then, yeah, I think with the driver one that you mentioned, I, you know, I don't know the exact motivation of that. I think there's been some thought that they call that the Dale Coyne rule because, of course, Dale <laughs> Coyne racing was always, oh, you know, changing Dale. the drivers. Well, and look, I, you know, I've seen some IndyCar drivers who have said, hey, like that rule actually benefited me. Like Dale gave me a yeah. chance, and if it wasn't for him, I might not be here right now. So there would be varying opinions on that, and that might have been part of the pushback as well. Uh, but, you know, I don't know the exact rationale on that. It, it, it could just be that they feel like it's better to just have drivers locked in for the whole season. But, again, with them, you know, capping the cars at three, I think that's a, a parity play, so to speak. Yeah, so, I mean, go ahead. Well, I just, you know, as far as my – I just wanted to address the Dale Coyne point because it's like, you know, we would all love to see the same drivers branded with the same sponsors all year long, and we build just incredible brand equity and all these nationwide – uh, brand marketing campaigns, and we've got superstars in the cars and superstars on the pit boxes. Um, but, you know, the sports fluctuate, and the teams, guys like Dale Coyne, I mean, he he makes a living racing, right? Like, that's – it's his race team has to be operate like a business, um, and th they go through times where they have to adjust their driver lineup based on the sponsorship provided, and, um, you know, hopefully we can continue to make tweaks to the sport that all go in the right direction, though. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And I think, you know, it'd be interesting to find out in due course if he's one of the two, you know, owners who needed some prodding to agree to this in part because he felt like some of these rules that we just discussed over the recent minutes weren't ones that matched up as well for his team. And like you said, the way he runs his business. And look, it's worked well for IndyCar to a certain degree over the years. I mean, him being able to bring in all these different drivers helped other teams see here's a kid who might be talented or he might not be talented. So, yeah, you know, I, I think it's just part of the evolution of the sport. 
I remember when NASCAR first started their charter system, you know, one of the main architects was Rob Kaufman, who's still the chairman of the RTA. And he was always saying, you know, I think NASCAR is a, a major league sport. And if you look at the major league baseball, you can't just go play the Yankees. You got to buy a franchise. You got to, you know, you can't just start a team out of nowhere and go play the Yankees. You have to, you have to buy in. And he felt like this was, that was part of professionalizing the sport and making it a major league sport is adding these charters and, you know, making it like that. So, yeah, I think there's clearly going to be some some effects from this and some trickle down effects and some unintended consequences, just like there always are with anything in life. But uh, we'll have, you know, I think this is just IndyCar's hope that overall this is going to professionalize the sport more. And again, we'll see how those uh, consequences play out. Yeah, and I would say a uh, personal dream of mine is to one day own a car in the Indy 500. And they still left me that possibility, Adam. So I, I'm really happy for them, and I love their charter design here and leaving the Indy 500 open. 